I'm J.B. Tate, president of the Historical Society, and I would like to welcome you back to another edition of Crossroads, which is an ongoing program on the history of Bartow County. Now today I would like to, for you to welcome with me David Archer, who will assist me in discussing the saga of the Cherokees and its impact upon Bartow County history. David, I've given some, given some thought to this, and I, th I thought the logical way to approach this would be to identify who the Cherokees were and then how they ended up here in, in Bartow County, and then finally why they were required or forced to leave here. And to make some sense of that, I thought it would be important to, a lot of people get the, the Etowah Indians and the Cherokees confused. And when the Cherokees were here, the Etowah Indians were already gone. And the Cherokees had no knowledge of them or who built the mounds and that sort of thing. Let me insert there. I found in some correspondence, uh, actually, that you gave me a copy of from, from the archives of the state of Georgia. Um, in, the, in the late 1700s, when the Cherokees had not really been in this area more than maybe 50 years, there was a uh, missionary who was sent here, I think by the Moravian Church, who actually went to the Indian Mounds with a number of Cherokee chiefs. And they were showing him the mounds, and in his correspondence, he was saying that they had no idea what it was. Um, they did tell him that, that during one of the wars that they, or battles that they had with the Creeks, uh, the Creek Indians, in the mid 1700s, that they actually used the Etowah Mounds as a battle site, mm -hmm. and I believe the Creeks, the Creeks got on top of the mounds, and and the Cherokees had to charge up the mounds, and of course they, the, the Cherokees eventually expelled the Creeks from this area, and 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 became associated with it, and the Creeks actually aren't associated with it, but they predated the Cherokees. That, that's right. A lot of people don't understand that the Creeks were actually here in this area before the Cherokees. Mm -hmm and prior to the Creeks were the Etowahs in, in that type of sequence. Mm -hmm. Cherokees took it away from the Creeks, and we took it away from them, I guess you might say. That's right. A modern day form of ethnic cleansing, right. you might say. <laughs> you know, the, um, the thing that's always fascinated me about the Cherokees, and I've spent a good deal of my adult life studying them, is of all the Indian tribes in North America, only five became civilized. And of all of the five civilized tribes who all lived here in the southeastern United States, the Cherokees were the most civilized. And I got, I got interested in their story in terms of how all of that happened. And what my research indicated was that at one time, uh, the Cherokees occupied what is now portions of Virginia and West Virginia, Kentucky, Tennessee, South Carolina, North Carolina, um, northeastern Alabama and north Georgia, which is an area about the size of Western Europe. And then through a whole series of treaties over several decades, by the end of the um, 1700s, they were reduced to what we pretty much know about the time of the removal, which is to say an area about exactly the same size as Massachusetts. 36,000 square miles, and most of that was North Georgia. Part, what, north, north of the Chattahoochee River, including all of Northwest Georgia, part of Tennessee, and a part of North Carolina. But by the time they were removed in 1838, that was it. That's I mean, right. That's, that's all they had left. So you go from, from an area as large as all of Western Europe, uh, reduced down to the size of current day Massachusetts to give you some visual idea of how much land they had left, which wasn't much. And that's really uh, why they determined to become civilized was a white man kept saying, you people are savages and you need to give your land to us because we're civilized. So the Cherokees made a determined effort to, uh, to become civilized on the white man's standards there. And to me, that's where they're, that's the most interesting part of their story is how they pull that off in about four, maybe five decades. I think there's a story, uh, an event that occurred around 1794 that may have helped this civilization uh, speed up a little bit. Uh, you and I have talked about the fact that there was 
a troop that came down from Tennessee, led by later Governor uh, Severe. Severe, mm -hmm. and they, they uh, the, the purpose was to attack a confederation of Creeks and Cherokees. In 1794, they got together and said, we got to do something about these white folks. And so they were gonna, they were gonna try to get together and, and, and run the white people out of their land. Uh, really one of the only uh, confederations of Creeks and Cherokees. And they had, a, they, had, they had a battle, it was actually a massacre, where uh, Governor Severe's troops attacked um, on the banks of the Coosa, and there's a marker over in Rome near Myrtle Hill Cemetery um, that marks the site of a somewhat of a bloody battle and a bloodbath. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of atrocities occurred, and and it's my understanding that after that, the Cherokees said, you know, this war stuff doesn't work real good. We, we're losing, and so they they tried the civilization as a means, as an alternative means of dealing with the white man. Didn't work, but they tried it. Well, that, that's point well taken. Actually, from 1776 until 1794, for 20 years, uh, the frontier here was just red with blood, and the Cherokees were on the short end of it. So you're absolutely right that, um, as a matter of fact, in the treaty in 1794, that the Cherokees renounced warfare. So from 1794 all the way up until the removal from Bartow County in 1838, uh, you don't find any organized warfare between Cherokees and white people because they declared that they would no longer use war as an instrument of uh, dealing with white people. When you, um, when you look at how they became civilized, um, I think it's interesting that, that the, the Cherokees invited um, missionaries into this area as one way to start that process. You know, the, the Cherokees were not interested in white man's religion, and they struck a deal with the missionaries that if the missionaries would be school teachers Monday through Friday, any converts they could get on Sunday, then they were welcome to that for Christianity. So what the, what the Cherokees did, they, uh, they appropriated money out of tri tribal annuities. You know, all that land they gave up, they got money for it, and it came in each year. And ultimately, they built, uh, they built 26 schools in the Cherokee Nation. And it was the missionaries, you know, first the Moravians, and then Presbyterians, and Baptists, and Methodists, who came in here to do mission work. Let, let, let me ask you something. What were the Moravians? I mean, that's not something that, that I've necessarily seen explained, and I don't know that I know what they are. Uh, Who were, what well, were they? Well, they were a religious sect in Germany that was harassed and persecuted and, and came to America. And their, their long suit, their forte here in America was working with Native Americans, not just the Cherokees, but with other Native Americans. And today, uh, for example, up at Winston-Salem, North Carolina, there's still a, a Moravian section of the city there. We don't have any Moravians around here anymore. No, not that, not that I'm familiar with, but th they did establish the first mission school with the Cherokees up at, um, uh, James Van sponsored them up at uh, Chat what is now Chatsworth, Georgia. Call Spring Place. Mm -hmm. right then, yeah. You know, interestingly enough, right here in Bartow County, as a matter of fact, within Oh, three to five miles of Cartersville was a Cherokee mission school, and it's called High Tower Mission. Now, unfortunately, we don't have uh, th that school disappeared, so we have no uh, no way to know what it looked like. There's not a photograph or um, a drawing or a painting of it, and, but we do have um, sketches of other mission schools and and other photograph of mission schools that did survive, which will at least give us the idea of what was here in Bartow County. Now, it's not clear where that school was located. We know, we know that um, it was across uh, the river from the mounds in that general vicinity. On Old Alabama Road. In, in that area. Yeah. Um, there have been a lot of people try to figure out exactly where that mission was, and, and I've heard, uh, two or three different stabs at, at locating it. Mm -hmm. One is around the area of Hansel Thacker's house in, in that general vicinity on Old Alabama Road. Uh, and I've also read in Lucy Cunyance's History of Bartow County, uh, she 
I don't know what her source was, but she said that it was more in the west part of the county. Uh, you and I have seen maps that put it on Alabama Road south of the Edward River, so mm -hmm. I don't know who's right, and I don't know that anybody definitely knows exactly where that mission was. Well, there's no shortage of interest in, in trying to find that mission mm -hmm. school. Um, in a state publication here that came out just several months ago, the North Georgia Journal, uh, Marion Hemperley, who is a surveyor general and has access to all uh, the early maps of the state, he wrote a major article uh, indicating that, I believe it was uh, the Wendell Thacker's uh, place instead of Hemperley. Wendell, 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 Wendell Thacker. Well, excuse me. Uh, but he, um, in, in this article, uh, he, what he uses is his justification to indicate the mission school was there was this huge chimney on Hansel Thacker's property. Now there is a cabin attached to the chimney, but it, the cabin's not original because the chimney far, is far too large for that yeah. small cabin. Yeah, that chimney is about the same, it's about a fourth as big as the cabin itself. Mm -hmm. Now I went out there to, to film um, this chimney and while I was there, Wendell Thacker was talking to me and he, we, we walked out to the well. Are you familiar with the well that's yeah, in front I've of his that. house? Well, that, that's a beautiful rock-lined well and that well was there, it was built by the Cherokees, the well in front of his house. And it, right in front of the well is Old Alabama Road. And Old Alabama Road, as you know, is one of the, it's the oldest road in North, North Georgia, at least North of Atlanta. But that was also a Cherokee road before white people used it as the main route to get over into Alabama territory. Yeah, I, you know, it's interesting that you can go into other counties, um, Cobb County, Floyd County, anything coming in, in a, in a northwesterly direction, any county in that direction, you can find segments of Old Alabama Road. You can go mm -hmm. in Cobb County right now and find segments of Old Alabama Road. Of course, it was an old wagon road, uh, and that's the road that the pioneers that originally came into this area came through, settled mm -hmm. on, and, and passed through on, on west. Of course, mm -hmm. west was Alabama at the time. That's right. You know, when I was talking to Mr. Thacker, he said that, um, that an elderly gentleman had told him, this is, of course, oral history, but um, we do know that that was a Cherokee site uh, where the chimney is, the well, and a man, a man named Thomas Pettit, Cherokee, owned that property at the time of removal, and Pettit Creek at the north end of Cartersville is named after him. But in any event, uh, Mr. Thacker told me that um, according to the oral history of that area, that the field behind his house there was a ball field. And of course, that was, the, that was like uh, football to Georgia Tech and the University of Georgia Bulldogs to Cherokees was stickball, uh, kind of a form of lacrosse that you find still played in Canada. So apparently that, um, and we also know that um, that there was a, a village that shows up on the maps called the village of Hightower, which was across the river. Now I, you know, most of us, when we, when we think of a, of a village, we think of a, like a town square with buildings and houses and that sort of thing. But Cherokee villages were not like that. Uh, if you look at the early maps, before the removal of the Cherokees here, Cherokee villages might go six or eight miles up and down the Etowah River on both sides. Isn't it true that the Etowah was in early days referred to as the High Tower River? It was not called the Etowah. It was, well, it's kind of interchangeable. They called it the High Tower River and then it, the Etowah and then the two became kind of interchangeable and then finally the Etowah River. But back to the villages for just a second, the, um, usually you'd have a council house and the way that usually worked was, since Cherokees didn't have the private ownership of land, a Cherokee would simply farm as much as he wanted to. So if he farmed 10 acres, then he would have 10 acres of land, and then his neighbor might have five or 20 acres. So this village would just go up and down the river based on that, but they would all meet at the council house in like a town center. You know, looking at this map, that uh, shows the district boundaries of the Cherokee Nation in 1820 and the location of Hightower Town, it looks like, it appears as if 
the Cartersville area was included within what was referred to as High Tower Town. Well, I think that's right mm -hmm. uh, from, from, from what I can gather looking at mm -hmm. that. Let me, um, let me come back to this idea of how the Cherokees became civilized and, and ultimately we can see evidence of that here in Bartow County. You know, one thing that Cherokees were blessed with in this time period was superb leadership. And what a lot of people are not aware of is how many white people had intermarried with the Cherokees even before whites were allowed into this area. So it was estimated that when the Cherokees left here in Bartow County that, um, and the rest of North Georgia and so on, that one-fourth of all the Cherokees were mixed bloods. And it was the mixed bloods that provided the leadership for the tribe. And of course, the most famous of all Cherokees, as you know, was John Ross. And John Ross spent time here in Castle up at, um, and uh, actually, I think you know a little bit more about early Castle than I probably do there. Uh, what would bring people like, um, oh, John Ross or Elias Boudinot or, um, say Major Ridge from what is now Rome and his son John to this area. They, they all attended uh, uh, the Cass Superior Court, which was organized about the same time that Castle was started as a as a town in 1832. One of the early Superior Court uh, uh, of the entire state was the Cherokee Judicial Circuit, which was situated in Castle. Mm -hmm. Since New Echota uh, was the capital of the Cherokee Nation was actually within, at that time, the boundaries of what was Cass County. Cass County uh, then included what is now known as Gordon County. So New Echota, the, the Cherokee capital, was actually within the same county and within, within the jurisdiction of the Cherokee Judicial Circuit with the, with the courthouse and the county seat being okay. at Castle. Mm -hmm. So uh, and I, I'm sure we'll touch on that a little bit later, but, but John Ross, Major Ridge, John Ridge, all of the key figures in the struggle that eventually occurred to see whether the Cherokees would stay here or be removed out west, all of them came and attended court at Castle. Mm -hmm. We've been able to locate some, some documents and correspondence in the archives of, uh, of the state of Georgia that where, where various of those individuals wrote about actual court sessions in Castle, and we'll talk about those a little bit later. Mm -hmm. If we... Um can shift the direction of this just a little bit. Um, you know, one thing I'm so impressed with is uh, the, some of the fine homes that the wealthier Cherokees built while they were here in Georgia. The, 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 the premier home, of course, was uh, the James Van House, which is just outside of Chatsworth, Georgia. It may be premier because it's one of the only ones left. Well, that's I true. Mean, <laughs> <coughs> Excuse me. Actually, there, there were two fine brick homes uh, built by the Cherokee, which was the pride of the Cherokee Nation. Uh, one was the Van House, and then there was another fine brick home in Tennessee, uh, in that part of the Cherokee Nation. So another good example is the, the uh, John and Major Ridge House over in, over in Rome that is now preserved and available for, for touring. That's right. It's, it's open, uh, I think, five or six days a mm -hmm. week. Um, really impressive. It, it really is. And, um, and of course, that's within 25 miles mm -hmm. or so of Cartersville. But, um, you know, there's another interesting story that directly connects with um, Bartow County and Cartersville, and that's um, Another fine home on the standards of the day belonged to uh, the Chief Justice of the Cherokee Supreme Court, a fellow by the name of John Martin, or Judge Martin. And I, th I think you uh, have found a story or two about Farish Carter. Yeah, uh, John Martin was uh, also was, was a mixed blood Cherokee. Mm -hmm. He was one fourth Cherokee but he affiliated with and considered himself to be a Cherokee. He was a highly educated man. He, he was raised actually in Virginia. Um, his father was full-blooded white, was I think uh, an, from Ireland, and he had married a, uh, a woman who was half Cherokee. Uh, and then when John Martin came to this area, uh, his entire family came at the time, and they were prominent. They were well-educated, and they were wealthy. 
they built a fine plantation home up uh, in what is now called Carter's Quarters, um, just south of Chatsworth. And when the lottery occurred, when the state of Georgia legislature passed laws that, that really nullified and, and declared the Cherokee Nation illegal and extended the jurisdiction and the boundaries of the state of Georgia over the Cherokee Nation. Uh, there was a lot of litigation about that. It went to the Supreme Court of the United States. It came back. There was a lot of litigation in Cassville about it. Mm -hmm. um, John Martin was treasurer of the Cherokee Nation. He got caught up in this struggle. Of course, his land was put into the lottery, just like all other Cherokees. Farish Carter, for whom Carterville is named after, um, drew a portion from the lottery and received John Martin's land. He also bought from a lot of other people that, that drew land around John Martin's land. And he, he bought and created a large estate. Well, in 1835, um, after the last treaty with the Cherokees and the state of Georgia was signed, the federal government was signed, the, the then governor of the state of Georgia wrote John Martin and says, Colonel Carter now wants you to get out of his house. I mean, the house that John Martin built, the, the plantation that, that two generations built, um, Colonel Carter came knocking. Colonel Carter wanted it, mm -hmm. and eventually Colonel Carter got it. David, I read a, an article doing some research one time on Ferris Carter that he ultimately put together 15,000 acres out of these land lottery tracks, which is, that's one considerable spread of land there. Yeah, let me, let me tell you a story that I read uh, that I found somewhat interesting as to how he did that. You know, we, we've already talked about the fact that he got some of the land through the lottery itself, but, but each person who received land from the lottery got a limited amount, usually 160 acres or a 40-acre tract if it was uh, in certain areas and referred to as a gold lot. Well, he got a 160-acre tract, and then, he, and then he went around and he bought many other 160-acre parcels from other people who had received it in the lottery. But after he amassed a few thousand acres, he still didn't have enough. He wanted some more. So the story that I read is what, what, old, uh, what old Paris Carter would do is he would he'd see a wagon coming in into Murray County with the family on it coming to look at the land that they had drawn in the lottery, hopefully probably from, from the pioneer's viewpoint to move on to it. Well, old Paris would put him on a real heavy pair of pants and then he'd put on another heavy pair of pants and he'd put about five layers of pants on and then about five layers of shirts, gloves, even though it may be in August or July, he'd put on gloves and he'd put on a big hat and pull it down over his ears and he would go down and he would meet this, this family, his, his new neighbors. And in, inevitably they would ask him, you know, why are you dressed like this in August? And he would tell the lady, he would direct that to the lady of the household, and he would tell her that the snakes were so bad in that area, the rattlesnakes, that he would not dare go out without five pair of pants and five wool shirts and gloves and a hat on in that neighborhood, even in August, especially in August, because of the snakes. And he would recommend that were they to move there, they dress likewise. Well, uh, usually they would talk about that a little bit and they'd sell the land to Ferris Carter at a reduced price because it was so snake infested. <laughs> uh, that, that is a great story. That, that's the guy that Carter was named after. <laughs> Stay with us and we'll return in just a moment. Let's play word association. What do you think of when I say whale? Me in a swimsuit. Okay, what about when I say slim and trim? Me, after visiting the General Nutrition Center. GNC carries a complete line of weight reduction products, including Diet Pep, Diet Max, and Diet Garana, designed specifically to help you lose weight by curbing your appetite, pepping you up, and giving you loads of energy naturally. So when you think swimsuit season... Think GNC in the Kmart Shopping Center. 
Rome Computer Service authorized agent for AirTouch Cellular. The new name for Pactel provides high-quality computer and cellular technology at a reasonable price. You can rent an NEC bag phone for only $6.95 per month, making it easy for companies to provide employees the benefit of cellular and receive the added sales that come with instant communication. Rome Computer Service authorized agent for AirTouch Cellular will answer questions or provide service. Rome Computer Service and AirTouch Cellular, the new name for Pactel. There is a permanent solution for unwanted body and facial hair. It's called electrolysis, and it's available at the Electrolysis Center. Now located inside Dazzles, a full-service hair salon offering tan stylists, two nail technicians, and tanning beds. The Electrolysis Center is owned and operated by Susan Donatio and offers the only permanent method of removing unsightly hair. Susan is also a licensed hairstylist. Both services are performed by appointment only. The Electrolysis Center, now located inside Dazzles Salon. Uh, let me <clears throat> redirect us uh, back to Bartow County here. You know, we've already talked about the Van House and uh, the Ridge House and, and the Martin Parish Carter Place. Um, you know, when you think about it, uh, the, the Cherokees have been gone from this county exactly 155 years. So I find it remarkable that there are still some structures left here that we can go out and see and photograph and, and talk about. And one of them that um, I think is real interesting is um, uh, the Cora Harris home. Of course, Cora Harris was a very famous author from this, from this area. And she, um, and she acquired, uh, well, she died 50 years ago, but uh, she lived for years in what Lucy Cunyas called an old Cherokee log cabin. And I, th I think you found some documentation on that going back to the early days. Yeah, I, I, uh, I guess what we're doing here is like football announcers. Am I the color guy? Is that what <laughs> You're the color uh, guy. I, I found a letter that was written uh, on April 13, uh, 1833, from apparently, according to what's been documented in, in the archives of the state of Georgia, uh, written from a guy who actually lived in what we now know as the Cora Harris home. Now, the author of this letter, his name is Henry Hagen, and apparently old Henry is worried because he's, he's heard that the Supreme Court of the United States has made some rulings in favor of the Cherokees and, and rulings that in effect said the state of Georgia can't take control over the Cherokee Nation because they're separate and distinct. Well, he's a little worried about that, and so I'd like to read this, if, if, if I could, what Henry said to the go then governor of Georgia. It was Cass County, Georgia, uh, 13th of April, 1833. His Excellency, Wilson Lumpkin, that's the governor at the time. Dear sir, the principal chief of the Cherokees has reported in this neighborhood that Congress had passed an act called the Enforcement Act, that is to compel obedience by all the states to all the acts of Congress and all the decrees of the Supreme Court are to enforce all the treaties within the Indians, with the Indians. He further reported that he had received a letter from the Secretary of War, which by the way would have been Lewis Cass, who Cass County was named after, um, that there was troops ordered onto the nation to remove all intruders from the same. Now, if this should be the case, they will find a considerable number of Georgians who have removed into this part of the country onto land that they have either drawn in the lottery or bought. And if those reports should be founded on facts, I would take it as a favor of your excellency to give me some information as you may think proper and address it to me at Pine Law, Cass County, Georgia. I remain your excellency's most obedient and humble servant, Henry Hagen. Now, old Henry is worried that he's gonna have to move off his land. I thought that was an interesting letter. Uh, that is an interesting letter. You know, um, the court, what is called in this county the Cora Harris home belonged to Chief Pine Log. That was his residence. And then, of course, the community of Pine Log was uh, derived, <coughs> derived its name from that particular Cherokee Indian. Mm -hmm. Apparently, what Henry Hagen did is whoever Chief Pine Log's descendants were, who the, the Cherokees who had that house, Hagen must have drawn that land lot in the lottery. 
And then what, what the white settlers would do is they would go onto the land, you know, and in the 18, early 30s, the Cherokees would still be living there, so they would buy the house that was on the land and maybe some of the personal property and implements from the Cherokee, and then the Cherokee would enroll and move on out west. That must have been what happened with the Cora Harris house and those people mm -hmm. that lived in it previously. You know, there's another home in the same geographical area out in the northeast part of the county here that was also uh, a Cherokee home, and that's, uh, that's known locally as the Howard home. And that's, that's an interesting place, and Mrs. Howard, she still has letters in her possession <clears throat> that date back to this time period of the removal of the Cherokees. Uh, as I understand it, it was correspondence from, you know, when the Cherokees left Bartow County, they were, of course, sent to Oklahoma. <clears throat> but the, the people who lived in that house um, corresponded back and forth. I think they have two families lived in that house and the descendants of those two families uh, since it was built sometime in the 1820s or early, I, I, I imagine that house was built in the 1820s, I, I'm not sure of that. But what I understand is the family, that the Cherokee family that lived in it either moved out no later than 1838 and then the Howard ancestors moved into it and now their descendants have lived in it all that time since. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, um, there's still another interesting, and now both uh, the Cora Harris, Cora Harris home is a log home, and of course that was originally, when you drive by it, you don't realize that, um, that that was an original log cabin too. There's still another one that um, is out at U Harley. By the way, U Harley was an Indian village. Um, I've looked at the, at the enrollment when they enrolled people to leave here, and there was a U Harley town or U Harley village. But there is a, a cabin out there that's, uh, according to Lucy Cunyas's book, Bartow County History, that it was an old log Indian cabin. And the other thing she said about that cabin that's interesting is that uh, Sam Jones, uh, the famous evangelist from Cartersville, that he preached his second sermon on the porch of that cabin after he had been converted to Christianity or to receive the call, whatever, because the Etowah River was at flood stage and they couldn't cross the river, so people came to that cabin to hear him preach. I had not heard that story. Mm -hmm. It's a neat cabin. I, I went in it some years back. It was in the Nan Phillips estate, and she left it, I think, to Berry College, and then Berry College sold it uh, to someone who later sold it, and I think there's two or three people bought it since then. Mm -hmm. Neat. It, it really is an excellent example of an 1820s log cabin. It's, it's really one and a half stories. It's got a little little loft upstairs. And neat house. Several years ago, maybe 20 years ago, I, I was out there to that cabin, and Nan Phillips was there with her husband at that time. And she told me this story about that cabin uh, passed down through her her family. In other words, her, her family apparently had that um, from the very early days of settlement here. And it seems like her, um, her ancestor, probably her great-grandfather, a fellow named Red Ligon, in a community that was, was named Ligon out there, that he had a general store and that he, he swapped a cow for that cabin. In other words, Cherokee had the cabin, according to, to Nan Phillips, and so her great-grandfather, ancestor, uh, he, knowing the Cherokee, knowing he was going to have to leave, that he accepted the cow in exchange for the cabin. So that's the oral history passed down in that family about the origins of that cabin. Mm. Now, there's finally one other um, structure here in, in Bartow County that um, that we've photographed and um, and looked at today. It's the uh, it's a funeral home up in the Daresville, and you'd never know driving by that place that the inside of that structure, in other words, the original structure was a large two-story log home, and then it's been added on to in the Victorian time period. But the original structure inside the facade is still the Cherokee dwelling there. Well, you know what's interesting is that house we know through oral history 
that that's the case, that inside that house is a log cabin. I wonder how many there are that we don't know about. You know, that, that's the thing that I'm, uh, because when I, about the time I think I've discovered everything that there is around here, somebody will come to me and say, are you aware of such and such place? Well, no, I'm not. So I tore down a log cabin. Uh, I and two or three people helped me tell one down that I had located uh, that was out Chulio Road um, almost before you get to New Harley, and I found out that my great-grandmother had lived in that. And the oral history I had of that is it had been a Cherokee cabin that, that, that her parents had moved into, or maybe her grandparents had moved into. Mm -hmm. But as things usually go, I, I, I tore it down, I did it perfectly, I labeled everything, I moved it to a site where I stored it, and uh, I called a um, pest exterminator and gonna get it termite treated. Thought that they had come, they didn't. Uh, by the next summer, the termites had eaten it and it fell in. That <laughs> thing was 150 years old and it took me one summer to ruin it. But uh, I have one piece of wood left out of it. So, so that, that's proud of that piece of wood. <laughs> that, that's your contribution to historic preservation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anybody got a cabin, call me. <laughs> I want to redirect our, our discussion here. I, I've got a series of maps I wanted to uh, uh, to, to spend just a couple of minutes on. And before I do that, um, you know, every, every 10 years in this country since 1790, we've taken a census, which reveals an awful lot of information about people and wealth and homes and whatnot. Well, in 1825, the Cherokees took a census. And of course, this is 15 years before they left here. Now, I think that census uh, gives a pretty good profile in terms of um, what the Cherokees had put together in this area before they were forced to leave. Let me just mention a few things out of this census I think people would find of interest. There were 13,783 Cherokees in 1825 in the Cherokee Nation. And they had at that time uh, 1,227 black slaves. You know, a lot of people do not realize that, uh, that the wealthier Cherokees who had these fine homes that we've already talked about, that they had large plantations, and they also, just like white people south of Chattahoochee River, that they had uh, black slaves till the land for them. You know, Joseph Van, who, the, the Van House up in, up in mm -hmm. Murray County, had a large number, I understand, of uh, slaves, had a lot of acres, had a big plantation, but the, the main thing that impressed me that he had, uh, that was unique for anybody at that period of time, is he had the finest stable of uh, thoroughbred racehorses uh, I, I've read in the world. And he would regularly go to Europe and and both breed and race his horses and then come back to his place at Spring Place in Murray County. Mm -hmm. and he was recognized around the world, apparently, as a, somewhat of a, uh, a breeder of renown. Uh, after horses, I mean, you understand what I'm saying. Right, I, I've run across uh, some, <laughs> similar information about him. Uh, back to this census for a moment, um, I thought this was interesting that the Cherokees had 22,531 head of cattle. They had 7,683 horses, and of course the staple for all people back then was hogs or swine, and they had 46,732 head of uh, swine. Another thing uh, that we've already talked about, uh, they had 20 public roads here in North Georgia. That's all in 1825. Yeah, this is in 1825. Uh, they had 18 ferries. We mentioned the Sally Hughes Ferry here on the Etowah River, Cartersville. They had um, 18 schools. By the time they left here, they had 26 schools. And they also had um, 2,943 plows, which indicates they were tilling an awful lot of land, uh, 10 sawmills and 13 grist mills. But that gives, I think, a pretty good profile of, um, of what they had in 1825. And notice that's 35 years before the American Civil War, to put that in some type of time perspective there. Now, I was looking at this. I've got some maps here in front of me um, about the distribution of population in Cherokee, Georgia. And we bracketed out what we think would be a pretty close facsimile of uh, Cass, now Bartow County. And if you notice, 
it's pretty heavily settled along the Etowah River here. And on this map, um, each dot would indicate that there were five people. So that's, um, that's a considerable concentration of population right here in, in Bartow County. On this other map, I've got, um, this indicates Cherokee land improvements. And again, we've got it bracketed out to what we think is Bartow County or a fair representation. And each dot represents 40 or 160 acres of land that was under cultivation to some degree or another. You know, I found a letter in the archives written by uh, a lawyer who lived in Capitol named William Underwood, who was involved in, in all the litigation that involved the Cherokees. This was written in 1838 to the governor, and he was talking about uh, he had spoken with those Indians who lived on what he called his land. I'm not sure how he acquired that land, but he said there were 40 families that lived on his land that's in and around Capitol. So that's 40 Cherokee families that lived on, I'm sure he had thousands of acres. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, that may indicate the density of the population. And each one of those obviously had a cabin, a home, or something that somebody right. wound up with. You know, let me, uh, let me take this opportunity to, to, to mention that, um, you know, mo most people are not aware that um, when they think of Indians, they think of teepees and wigwams, and the Cherokees never lived in teepees or wigwams after they became civilized. What they lived, the, the poorer Cherokees lived in log cabins, and the wealthier Cherokees lived in the type of homes we've already discussed. But you know, before the, the Cherokees became civilized, they had a, um, say back in the George Washington time period in that circle of history, even there they didn't live in teepees or wigwams, they lived in, um, in a kind of an adobe type structure. Kind of waddle and daub. Yeah, the, the, the waddle was the branches that they interwove together and then the daub was the clay or mortar type construction and we have, um, we have some pictures of where archaeologists and, and anthropologists have recreated like a Cherokee village. There's a site here in Bartow County that I have uh, gotten some archaeological reports on excavations that were done. And I believe those excavations were done in like 1946 by Joseph Caldwell. You've seen some of his work. Mm -hmm. He discovered a waddle and daub structure that, that in his excavations, uh, and this was in the Lake Altoona area, the part that was going to be flooded when they eventually built the dam in the lake, and he was trying to discover some of those archaeological sites prior to the, to the flooding of the lake, and he discovered and reported that, that he wanted to go back and excavate this site where he found an actual preserved waddle and daub structure, hmm. but he never he, he never got to do it. They flooded the lake and he went on to other parts of the country and so I guess under the lake now there's a waddle and daub thing <laughs> floating around somewhere. Okay, let's um, let, let's take this in a little bit different direction here. I'm, I'm still thinking in terms of the senses and what it revealed. You know, um, one thing I indicated, they had a number of grist mills and I have a, a photograph um, of a grist mill that's not in Bartow County, it's over in Cherokee County. And unfortunately, vandals <coughs> burned that structure in the 1950s, but we're lucky to have a photograph of it. And it was built and belonged to a, a local chief over there named Chief Welch. And another thing that is not in the census here that I found interesting is that the, um, the Cherokees had um, a number of hotels not a large number, but um, two of them are still in existence. And both of them would be over 150 years old. Now one of them is in excellent repair because they took it, it was on the uh, Chattahoochee River, across the river from Gainesville, Georgia. And when they were going to build Lake Lanier, that was that whole, the Cherokee Hotel was gonna be destroyed. So they numbered the logs, took it apart, and then took it up to New Echota at the state park. But that, that Cherokee Hotel was built in um, 1819. You know, one, one interesting thing about that hotel, when you spent the night at the Cherokee Hotel, 
You know, the downstairs would be for, like the Marriott, would be for eating and drinking. And then you'd go up the staircase upstairs to sleep, spend the night. And there were two rooms up there with um, four, two beds for each room. So if you got in bed as a traveler, traveling through the Cherokee Nation, well, after you'd been asleep for a while, don't be surprised if somebody didn't come and get in bed with you. I believe I'd have slept in the woods. <laughs> <laughs> but that, that was not only with Indians, but that was true of white um, accommodations back then. You didn't, unlike today, you didn't rent a room, you just rented a, a bed. Or if you're by yourself, you just rented part of a bed. J.B., one of the houses or the hotels that you had a photograph of, is that the one or one of those that, that James Van was shot in? That's the, that's the hay barn picture that we, we just showed that um, it was a hotel. And if you look carefully at that photograph, you'll see that the upstairs has a big opening under the tent awning. And originally there was a staircase going up there. <clears throat> that hotel was moved across the road. They put logs under it and moved it across the road. So the original hotel was actually, if you go up there, is, is originally across the road. And James Van, who was uh, despised and hated by a lot, he had a lot of enemies. And that's right, he was assassinated there. But to this day, nobody knows exactly where his, where his grave is up there. That's lost in the midst of time. Mm -hmm. Stay with us and we'll return in just a moment. I wanted to redirect us to one other thing here that I, I think is important. Um, you know, the Cherokees produced a genius, and he was a mixed blood like uh, we've been talking about. Um, his name, his English name was either George Guess or George Gist. It's spelled two different ways there. Most people are familiar with him with his Indian name. Cherokee name was Sequoia. You know, he did what no other person on the planet Earth has ever done as an individual, which is to create an alphabet for an unwritten language. And to me, the fascinating thing about him is that um, he, was a, he was an illiterate. He could not read or write any language, which compounds his achievement to be able to create a, a, an alphabet for the Cherokee language. And particularly, I'm impressed when I found out that Harvard University had been working for years trying to come up with an alphabet for the Cherokees, and where Harvard failed, this Indian genius succeeded. But you know, all success has its, has its problems. I, mean, I read a story, and I'm not making this up, that during the time that, that Sequoia was working on the alphabet, he would go out from, from the log cabin that he and his wife lived in, and he would work out in this little shed that he had. Mm -hmm. And it took him, I think, seven years or something to do it, but he'd stay out there for days and nights. He wouldn't come in and he wouldn't be a good husband. And his wife actually took a broom to him once because she got so sick and tired of him working on that alphabet. So, he, you know, even great men have problems. Well, actually, the story's worse than that. What his wife did out of disgust with his with his hobby here was to take all of his work and chucked it in the fireplace and burned it and he had to start over again. So the, the story's even worse than, worse than, ever, yeah. than the broom, yeah. yeah. But you know, um, once they had an alphabet, uh, they really made incredible progress in a hurry. For example, they, uh, they hired a, a firm up in Boston to make them a printing press and it was taken by a steamer down the coast. The alphabet like that was 1821? Is that right? Uh, I think 21 or 22 with the alphabet, 
But the printing press was 1827 when they contracted to have it built. And it was in place up at New Achota, about 25 miles north of Castle. And they began to print the first Indian newspaper in North America. It's called first, the first paper of any kind in Northwest Georgia, I understand. That's right. It was the first paper, say, north of Atlanta. Call it what, the Phoenix? Cherokee Phoenix. Cherokee Phoenix. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I, um, I read one time that they had subscribers to that newspaper as far away as Hamburg, Germany. And today, there are a few original issues at the Widener Library at Harvard, but they have the whole complete set of the Cherokee Phoenix in a museum in London. So people in Europe were fascinated what was going on up here in the hills and woods of, of Cass and, and Northwest Georgia. Yeah, all these legal battles that the Cherokees waged, with, which I think we're going to talk about in a minute, you know, there was a big national audience. Um, even the treaty of 1835 that eventually brought the removal of the Cherokees was discussed and debated on a national scene. It was not just a little local thing here. That's right. Um, and when it went through the Senate, all treaties have to be ratified by the Senate of the United States. And it, it only passed by one vote. And, and there was a national hue and cry about whether it was fair or not fair, everybody taking sides. The Cherokees had a lot of supporters not to have to leave here. For example, uh, Davy Crockett from Tennessee was a congressman, and he pointed his finger at Georgia and said, shame. Uh, Daniel Boone was a congressman at this time. He pointed his finger at Georgia and said, what Georgia's doing is unconscionable. And Daniel Webster, Henry Clay, two famous senators, also sided with the Cherokees in this struggle to remove them here from Georgia. You know, Sam Houston, who moved on out to Texas eventually and mm -hmm. is associated with Texas was was uh, he spent many years as a as a Cherokee in, around Maryville, Tennessee. That's right. He and, lived, he literally lived with them for two years. Yeah, and he he fussed a lot about about what Georgia did. Mm -hmm. Well, speaking of uh, of government, you know the the Cherokees had a viable central government of their own. Up, again, 25, 30 miles north of Cartersville, called New Achota. And I've always found it fascinating that they had a Supreme Court 20 years before the state of Georgia. They had a two-house national legislature. And in 1827, they even adopted a written constitution. So they, it, it was a viable government up there with a, with a capital, uh, you know, up to, that, uh, up to the point that Georgia took the jurisdiction away from them. Mm -hmm. You know, David, you'd think, um, after all we've said, with all the progress these people made in such a short span of time, for example, it was estimated that three-fourths of the Cherokees could read and write the, the Cherokee alphabet and the Cherokee language by the time of the removal. With all these achievements, you'd, you'd wonder, why, why didn't we allow them to stay? So I, I'd like for you to tell me what, what set the wheels in motion here to, to drive the Cherokees out of Georgia. For, for many years at the time the Cherokees were eventually um, either bargained out or driven out, depending on which viewpoint you want to believe, the state of Georgia had been trying to get the land that the Cherokees called their own, their nation, within the boundaries of the state of Georgia. It dated back to the 1700s, some of the early treaties. But so, you know, the Cherokees just withdrew and withdrew and withdrew and got back to this small area we talked about in the beginning of the program, which consisted of northwest Georgia, a little bit of Tennessee, and a little bit of North Carolina. That's all they had left. They called it their enchanted land. And, uh, you know, if you look at the hills and valleys of this area, uh, compare those to what they eventually moved to in Oklahoma, you see why they would call it this, their enchanted land. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of difference in here in Oklahoma, as you well know, since you grew up in Oklahoma. But what happened that, that really accelerated the effort to move the Cherokees out of the state of Georgia was the discovery of gold in 1828, I think it was, in, uh, in and around Dahlonega, and also some in, in this area. Mm -hmm. The Dahlonega Gold Belt, um, really extends all the way through um, Cherokee County, southeast part of Bartow County, on into Pauline County a little mm -hmm. bit. So there was gold in them Thar Hills <laughs> in 1828, way, I, and this was before they discovered gold in California. That's right. By 20 years, um, I once read that uh, that 
belt of gold is two to six miles wide, and it starts about 20 miles above Dahlonega, comes right through Bartow County, the southern part of the county, and finally plays out over near Carrollton. That's right. But two to six miles wide, and if you look at the early survey plats here with the, the land lottery, a lot of the land, original land lots are 40 acres in the southern part of the county here because that's, that's in the belt of gold. And then once you got outside that belt of gold, it would be 160 acres. Uh, yeah, the 40 acre lots they actually call uh, gold, gold lots. lots. Mm -hmm. and, and that was the official designation. They didn't call it 40 acre lot, they call it a gold lot. Uh, of course, you know, not many settlers found gold that came into this area, but that's what really speeded up the process. And in 1829, after gold was discovered in Georgia, a number of things happened that, that figured into the formula that spelled the eventual doom less than 10 years later for the Cherokees in this area. One thing is Andrew Jackson was elected president of the United States and, and took office. The other thing that happened, in addition to the gold being discovered in that same, same time period, is that the Georgia legislature passed once Andrew Jackson became president, they felt like they had a friend in the White House on the issue of, of, of Indian removal. His, Andrew Jackson's whole, everything that he had said, and one of the issues he ran on, was that he would remove all of the Indians within the state of Georgia and any other Indians east of the Mississippi, he was gonna move them west of the Mississippi. Mm -hmm. He was gonna speed up that process. Well, with that, that having been said and that having been thought by the legislature and the, and the government of the state of Georgia, in December of 1829, the Georgia le legislature passed laws to extend complete jurisdiction of, of the state of Georgia laws over the Cherokee Nation and declared, this is a quote from that law, that all laws, usages, and customs made and established and enforced in the said territory by the said Cherokee Indians be, and the same hereby is, on and after the first day of June 1830, declared null and void. Well, they just said, you know, we know you got, uh, you got a legislature up there, and we know you got a constitution, we know that you really probably have a more uh, democratic style of government than we do, you can read better than we can, you got a newspaper, you got better houses, you got everything going for you up there, but we want it because there's gold on it, so we declare you null and void. Mm -hmm. Now that started a series of legal skirmishes. The Cherokees, as you said earlier in the program, had given up uh, warfare as a method of combat. So they took on litigation as a method of combat. They hired the best lawyers in the country. They didn't have uh, Bartow County lawyers. You know, everybody knows you gotta go, you gotta go somewhere else to get a good lawyer. Now, people may come here to hire a good lawyer, but they gotta come from somewhere else. Well, the Cherokee Indians went to Boston and they hired some, a law firm out of Massachusetts. And they went to the Supreme Court and they sued the state of Georgia. And they did that uh, right in January of 1831, they filed a lawsuit. It's entitled, still written in the law books, Cherokee Nation versus State of Georgia. And they tried to get the Supreme Court of the United States to declare that the State of Georgia simply did not have the power to, exp to extend its jurisdiction over the Cherokee That's Nation right. mm -hmm. and declare them null and void. Well, the Supreme Court dodged the bullet. Instead of taking on that issue as they then and as they do today sometimes, they just sidestep a question. They refused to accept the case on a jurisdictional matter. Mm -hmm. They said the Cherokee Nation is a separate nation, but it's not like a foreign nation, and our Constitution does not allow a domestic nation, which they declared the Indians to be, to sue a state in the Supreme Court. So they just dismissed the case. Right. Mm -hmm. So the, the Boston lawyers, in a combination with lawyers from that lived in Cass County and resided in Castle and practiced in Castle, got together, they figured they had to do something to get it back before the Supreme Court. And, and the state of Georgia answered their beck and call. In 1831, they adopted another law, and they said that it would be against the law for any white man to be in the Cherokee Nation without a permit from the state of Georgia. And as you know, that brought on some, some arrest of missionaries those missionaries refused to accept pardons from the state of Georgia after they were convicted and sentenced to four years in prison. That issue wound up in the Supreme Court of the United States, and the Supreme Court declared that, that the state of Georgia did not have the power to legislate and to take jurisdiction over the Cherokee Nation. That 
seem to give hope to the Cherokees, but Andrew Jackson said, and that's the famous case, it's one of the only times in the history of this country, that the President of the United States has just absolutely refused to obey a, a Supreme Court opinion. He said, John Marshall, the Chief Justice, wrote the opinion, let him enforce it. That had to bring on legislation from Congress, the Federal Congress, to actually enforce the Supreme Court opinion. Uh, the state of Georgia refused to abide by it. So you really got the spectacle of, of the president defying the Supreme Court and in the state of Georgia defying the federal government since the, the Cherokees were under the federal government's jurisdiction by a treaty. So you've really got one incredible mess here of three jurisdictions, the Indian's jurisdiction, the state, and now the federal government. I know we're winding down. I want to mention one thing that, that as to the litigation, Cassville in Cass County, the, the courthouse that was there was the scene of a legal struggle that continued after the Supreme Court ruled in the Cherokee Nation's favor in, in the Worcester case. What the Cherokees did then was wage battle in Cass County. They, they, they couldn't get the President of the United States to obey the Supreme Court of the United States. So they tried to get local judges here in Cass County to rule in their favor to prevent white people from coming in and kicking them off their land by, by asking for injunctions. And they found one in, a, in the first judicial circuit judge of the Cherokee Judicial Circuit, um, Judge John Hooper, who was appointed in 1832. From 1832 till he was actually removed from office in 1835 because he was ruling in the favor of the Indians, uh, he, he did grant injunctions. He did support and accept the ruling of the Supreme Court of the United States and apply that and stop the power of the state of Georgia for about three years till they were able to, to get him out of office and to legislate taking the power of judges away, uh, which is hard to believe that happened in a democratic society, but that's what happened. Judge Hooper, who lived in Cass County, and I think is one of our unsung heroes, uh, very little is known about him. He stood up against the power of the state of Georgia. He tried to prevent the state of Georgia from, from violating and acting contrary to federal law. And the thanks he got for that is he was removed from office. He left this county. He eventually went on to uh, Floyd County, uh, Dade County he's associated with, and he's buried over at Myrtle Hill Cemetery now. He should be entitled to a chapter in, in Profiles of Courage that was written by John F. Kennedy some years ago as to people who stand up against things they think are wrong because of their own personal character. Well, the odds were in Super Bowl with what he was challenging there. You know, there, there's a wonderful story about uh, a jailbreak up at Castle dealing with Cherokee Indians. Yeah. Uh, Judge Hooper is associated with that story. After the 1835 treaty um, that brought about the eventual removal, of the Cherokees from this area. The Cherokee Nation that was, that was meeting in exile uh, over in Tennessee because Georgia, the legislature had said they couldn't meet in Georgia. Mm -hmm. they, were, they didn't exist. They were null and void. They had to go to Tennessee and meet. They adopted a law that said that anybody that signed a treaty that sold any more Cherokee land would be put to death. It was a Cherokee Nation law. So uh, when those leaders who had bolted from the John Ross party and the party who wanted to stay here, who, when they started signing treaties and negotiating with the federal government, they sentenced themselves to death, is the way the Cherokee looked at it. Mm -hmm. So there was actually one of those individuals who was a part of the, of the treaty party, they call them, who was killed in Bartow County, in, Ch in Cass County. And he was arrested. And uh, he was taken to the Cass County Jail and I have a letter, the way I know about this is some of these letters that have been written uh, um, that are in the archives of the state of Georgia. But there's an interesting letter in 1835 that, that says uh, who it was that, that actually was arrested and who he killed. Uh, Eli Hicks was the one that was killed. And in August the 30th of 1836, they actually uh, found and, and arrested Joseph Lynch who had uh, broken into the jail and freed James McDaniel. Um, 
Now, when he did that, he also freed everybody else in the jail, in the Cass County Jail. He set out all of the, the Indians that they had arrested for killing uh, their own people, but he also freed all white folks. I, I think they were, I don't know if they called them poor white trash back then <laughs> or not, but, but all the, the, the prisoners that were in the jail were set free. So there's a series of letters that are really interesting written by Cass County citizens to the, to the governor in 1835 saying, send the Georgia Rangers in. That's what they call the militia. Mm -hmm. Send them in because we got all these escaped convicts, Indians and white folks and murderers and thieves running around. And so they actually did send in a, a, a division or an attachment of the Georgia Rangers to keep order and to find uh, these folks and arrest them for breaking into the jail. It's really good correspondence and you have to read it to totally understand uh, how significant that big jail break in Cass County was. That's interesting. Well, we do have to bring this to a close and what I would, what I'd like to do is, um, is finish up the sequence of events here. A treaty was signed by less than 200 Indians in 1835 known as the Treaty of New Echota. And the John Ross majority party, they got 15,900 signatures denouncing this, in other words, 15,000 Indians are against the treaty, 200 are for it, but the government bought into the treaty and confirmed it. That's the one the Senate ratified. The Senate of the United States ratified it by one vote. By one vote, that's how close it was. And then the Cherokees were, were given two years to prepare to leave here. So two years went by, and in 1838, uh, General Winfield Scott and, as I recall, six or 7,000 federal soldiers were sent here to round up the Cherokees. Uh, all summer long, they rounded up Cherokees and they put them in concentration camps, and they died like flies there. The real, the tragedy of the Cherokees started in those, in those camps there. They kept them there during the winter months. They, they put them uh, well, there in the fall. Well, throughout the summer into the fall. Mm -hmm. And in the fall of 1838, they began to trek to Oklahoma. If you ever wonder why they sent them to Oklahoma, all the Indians back then, if you looked on a United States map, what it said about Oklahoma, Great American Desert. Mm -hmm. In other words, land unfit for white folks, so let's put Indians on that. Well, in any event, uh, it's estimated that um, over well, approximately 4,000 Cherokees died between Georgia and Oklahoma. And the Cherokees called it the trail where we cried, and in our history books it's called the Trail of Tears. Now, you know, the Cherokees just didn't vanish out there in the prairies. For example, today the Cherokees are the second largest Indian um, tribe in the United States. In Oklahoma alone they have about 120,000 members in the tribe, which covers about um, 14 counties out there. And I think the interesting thing is that the chief of the Cherokees today is a woman, and she's quite famous in this country. Her name is Wilma Mankiller. I think a, a fitting tribute uh, to end our story would best be expressed by a statement that Chief Seattle said, even though he, wasn't, he was not a Cherokee, I think that his statement would have spoken quite clearly for what the Cherokees believed while they lived here. at Hardy Chevrolet have been taking care of their neighbors for a good long while by making sure they get high quality.